Hi everyone, my name is Wendy L. Sasser and I work in the ARM Research Group. And in this video, I'm going to cover Gen 5 changes that were made to the memory controller. And these changes add new controller features and the ability to support LPDDR5. I also want to note when this is discussed in the Gen 5 workshop, we will also be discussing additional controller changes that are covered in a separate video. And these changes look at ways to refactor the memory controller and add an initial NVM interface. In this video, we're going to start with a DRAM overview and look at the LPDDR5 requirements. Then we'll take a deeper dive into the updates that were made for GEM5 and look at the trade-off and tuning options available. And then we'll close with next steps. This cartoon is a very high-level depiction of how DRAM functions, so there's a lot of details that are missing. But I want to highlight a couple of points here. You know, we start with a 1T, 1C bit cell, build that up into a larger array. And within that array, we have parallel resources or banks that can be accessed concurrently. And different technologies have different levels of parallelism within their array. When data is transferred, it's transferred across multiple unit intervals that is defined by the burst length. And there is a data rate that's defined, and that data rate historically has been twice the command frequency. Looking at LPDDR5, LPDDR5 has redefined the clocking, arch clocking architecture. It supports data rates up to 6,400 megabits per second, but it defines a command clock that is limited to 800 megahertz. It also defines a separate data clock, and that data clock does run up to 3200 megahertz. And with a dual data rate capture and transfer, we can get the 6400 megabit per second data rate. But essentially what this means is we no longer have a 2 to 1 ratio for data to command clock. We instead have a 4 to 1 at lower data rates and an 8 to 1 at higher data rates. There are two bursts that are supported, a burst to 16 and a burst to 32. And the first table shown in this um, slide looks at the available command cycles per burst. For a burst to 16, when we're running at higher data rates, we are limited to two commands. A burst to 32, we would be limited to four. Similar to other technologies, LPDDR5 does require multiple cycles to send certain commands. Specifically, the activate requires two cycles. A precharge still can be issued in one, and a read or write may require one or two depending on synchronization, which we'll cover more detail later when they, that's needed. But essentially, the main takeaway from this slide is that at data rates greater than 3200, there are cases where we may be command bus limited. And this slide is illustrating that point in more detail where we take a single scenario. Now, granted, this is a worst case scenario, but uh, we look at 64 byte random data accesses, a burst to 16 with a 16 bit interface. So that's a single channel LPDDR5, an eight to one ratio and no auto precharge. The intent here of the command stream is to basically rotate through the banks. So we're trying to pre-charge and activate banks ahead of schedule or ahead of time so that they're prepped and ready to go and we can issue the reads seamlessly and get 100% utilization on our data bus. The top timing diagram illustrates what potentially could happen with LPDDR5 with the two cycle activate and the limited command bandwidth. This shows that while we are trying to rotate through the banks and we're trying to get that 100% data bus utilization, due to being command limited, we cannot issue the reads quick enough and potentially or subsequently have a two cycle gap between the bursts. The diagram below shows what could happen if we didn't model um, command bandwidth or we didn't verify command bandwidth and allowed the commands to overlap. In this case, the commands could overlap, we would still meet the required bank timing parameters, but the performance would be erroneously optimistic. Switching gears to the bank architecture, LPDDR5 defines three bank architectures, an 8-bank mode, a 16-bank mode, and a bank group mode. These are user-definable um, and set at configuration time. They all have different trade-offs. So starting with the eight bank mode, the eight bank mode has a 512 bit prefetch and therefore is limited to a burst of 32 and has a 64 byte minimum access. 
It does support the maximum data rate, so it can run or can be used for data rates up to 6,400 megabits per second. But given that it only has eight banks, it has half the parallel resources, a larger page size, and longer activate to activate delays. Moving to 16 bank, we can support 16 or 32 bursts, given that we have a 256-bit prefetch. We have smaller access granularities, therefore 32 byte is the minimum. And with 16 banks, we have twice the parallel resources, but we are limited to 3200 megabits per second for the data rate. Moving to a bank group architecture, we still have 16 banks, but we've organized them into four banks per bank group. We can support up to 64 megabits per second, so we can support the full data rate. We support uh, 16 or a burst to 16 or a burst to 32 with our 256 bit prefetch and have a minimum access granularity of 32 bytes. Theoretically, we have 2x the parallel resources because we have 16 banks, but we do need to account for longer interbank group delays. The one caveat with the bank group architecture is we cannot seamlessly issue a burst to 32. With a burst to 32, we have two scenarios here that are shown, an eight bank architecture as well as a bank group architecture. And in the eight bank architecture, we can use uh, the current logic and the current parameters that we have defined within GEM5 to model this. Uh, essentially, we're using T-burst, which is the minimum column to column delay. For this uh, scenario, it's four cycles. So we see in this timing diagram, we're issuing bursts every four cycles and subsequently get a continuous stream of data on the data bus and 100% utilization. Looking at the bank group architecture, it's not quite that simple. When we issue the first command to bank group N, CAS latency delay later, we get the first half of the burst. Then there is a gap, a two cycle gap, before we receive the second half of the burst. So we've reduced the potential um, data bus utilization. To account for that or to mitigate that, the LPDDR5 spec enables or allows for interleaved bursts. So that's shown here with the second access to bank group M, which is highlighted in the blue. And we issue that two cycles after the first access. And you can see within the data bus, we now have an interleaved access and 100% utilization. So this requires a couple new parameters, and we'll go into more detail of those parameters in subsequent slides, but essentially we've added different variations of T-burst. So a min T-burst defines the minimum delay between accesses to different bank groups. T-burst defines the actual delay it takes to transfer the burst. So in this case, it is six clocks because it takes two clocks for the first half, a two cycle gap plus two clocks for the second half. And then we've added another parameter, T-burst max, which is used um, to, uh, for synchronization and also for uh, write to read delays. And it's defined in the DRM spec as the minimum column access time. Now that we have a little bit uh, better understanding of what LPDDR5 entails and the different things we need to account for in GEM5, we're going to go through the changes we made and look at different options we have with the LPDDR5 uh, or new features that were added for LPDDR5. I briefly discussed or talked about synchronization, but didn't really go into the details of why we need it or what it's doing. Um, at a high level, synchronization is needed to ensure that the command clock and the data clock are synchronized or, or in phase. And there's two basic options. We've included a new parameter, data clock sync, which basically select between those two options. So when data clock sync is true, that is basically a dynamic sync, which is a power optimized condition. And in this case, the data clock is only driven for active bursts, and the clock will be idle or in a high Z state when bursts are not actively being transmitted. This, though, uh, requires additional commands, so we need to actually ensure that we issue a synchronization command before our read or write burst so that the data can be transferred or received correctly. So we've now taken what was a single cycle read or write and required a two cycle operation, two cycle command operation with a sync plus read or write. Um, from a GEM5 perspective, we have 
uh, modeled this, but we haven't modeled all the features. So we do not have the global sync concept modeled within Gem5, which is a standalone command that allows synchronization across multiple ranks. The other case for data clock sync is when it's false, and this mimics an always on mode. This is for um, better performance, uh, easier scheduling, but it is less power efficient. And in this case, the data clock is continually driven, so we don't need to send synchronization commands dynamically as we um, issue bursts. There are additional core screen controls that could be used, but at this point in time, they have not been implemented in Gem5. In this case, the data clock sync false case is also the default case for non-LPDDR5 technologies, indicating that synchronization is not required. Synchronization command is required when data clock sync is true and when we issue a burst outside of a synchronization window. That window starts when the memory captures a new read or write burst. We capture this within Gem5 with a new variable, last burst tick, which is defined per rank. The duration of the window is a function of CAS latency and T burst max. And this information is used when we issue the next burst. If that burst falls within that window, we do not send a synchronization command. And we also shift the window to start with the new command issue. This window is used, you know, first of all, to determine if a synchronization command is needed, but also it's used to indicate when the data clock will be active. So we can use this information for IO power, looking specifically at the data clock IO power. Shifting gears to the command bandwidth check, previously we showed that there are some worst case scenarios where we may become command limited with LPDDR5. So we added a command bandwidth check within Gem5. And the point here was not to be cycle accurate, but what we did instead was create a window and we used the duration of a data burst as the window and we defined the maximum number of commands that could issue in that window. And that's calculated within the model based on configuration parameters. We utilize a new variable, burst ticks, which is an unordered set of multi of ticks, an ordered multi-set of ticks, and it essentially stores the number of commands that have been issued within a burst aligned window. The flow is highlighted here where we basically take the tick that the command will issue, burst align it. Now it's only burst aligned for this check, not burst aligned for the actual issuing of the command. We burst align it and then check that burst align address to determine how many commands have been issued already in that burst align window. If we have room to issue one more command. We haven't reached our max yet. We go ahead and say we're done. We found a window where we can issue it and we insert that new command into burst ticks and carry on. If we have already reached our max, we shift to the next burst window and try again. And we keep doing that until we find a window where we do have room to issue a new command. For cases where we have multiple cycles that need to issue for a command, so that would be a read or write burst with a synchronization or a multi-cycle activate, we verify that all commands can issue. And there's another parameter that's included in this or another variable that's included that specifies the maximum delay between these two cycle commands. For the synchronization command, it defaults to TCK because they do need to issue back to back with the read or write bursts. For activates, LPDDR5 provides a little bit more flexibility for scheduling uh, and defines a new variable, TAAD, which defines the maximum delay between the activate1 and activate2 commands. So we use that within our bandwidth check to try to optimize where the activates are issued and ensure that we're getting the um, biggest bang for the buck from our command bandwidth. When considering your command bandwidth options and the potential of being command bandwidth limited or having contention on the command bus, there are certain things or certain variables that are going to dictate whether or not you are likely to be command limited or not. Um, of course, uh, for LPTDR5, this really is more of a factor when we're running at higher data rates, greater than 3200, which requires an 8 to 1 data to clock ratio. But there's additional knobs that are going to affect this. They are listed here, burst length, minimum access, granularity, the page policy, meaning do you have auto precharge uh, enabled or you close bank, open bank, um, the synchronization mode, the data rate, and of course, if you do require two cycle activate.
looking at interleaving with uh, bank group uh, architecture and a burst of 32, interleaved access enable us to have 100% data bus utilization. So we added support for that within GEM5. It's enabled based on the T-burst values. So if you remember previously, we talked about new T-burst parameters that have been defined, and we enable interleaving when T-burst does not equal T-burst min. Currently, that is enabled for LPDDR5 configurations that have bank group architecture and burst to 32. The flow diagram there indicates how we've actually added support for that within GEM5. So we basically look at when a command is supposed to issue, when we want to issue a command. We have a variable that holds the burst or the tick of the last burst, and we use tburst min. So if the command can issue tburst min cycles after the last burst tick, we know that we're interleaving that burst. If the command cannot issue or issues at a duration that is greater than tburst min beyond the last burst tick, we are not interleaving or could not actually um, send the command at the interleaving boundary. In that case, we need to ensure that we don't have data bus contention on the bus. So we ensure that the command will issue at a minimum at the last burst to plus T burst to ensure there is no contention. Now I also reference here burst gap. That's basically what's used to determine when the next burst can issue. And hopefully that'll be more clear when we look at the next picture with timing diagrams. So in the first timing diagram, we are interleaving. So we start with uh, a reader write to bank group zero. When we start, we issue the tburst gap to be tburst min because that's optimally when we want to send the next command. We find a command in which case, in, in this case, we can interleave. That is an access to bank group one. So that issues at tburst min or two cycles later. Since we are interleaving, we update tburst gap to be equal to tburst, which is six cycles. And here we're showing a third command that's issuing six cycles later to bank group two. If we look at the data bus, this basically results in 100% data bus utilization. So essentially, we're just switching between um, the, the gap between the commands in order to ensure that we're interleaving and then don't have bus contention. In the second case, the non-interleaving case, we need to ensure that the second command does not issue too early. We've determined that it cannot issue at an interleaved boundary. So we need to ensure that at a minimum, it is, it is not issued until T-burst cycles have expired. So this is showing the read occurring in the first cycle. Six cycles later, a read to an alternate bank group is issued. And looking at the data bus, we see the, um, the second read is issued right after the first read completes. No data bus contention, but we didn't optimize the data bus utilization because we could not interleave. Looking at next steps, there are features in LP5 that haven't yet been incorporated into GEM5. Um, this by no means is an exhaustive list, but I've taken some of the features and split them into low power features and everything else. From a low power perspective, these are features that affect the DRAM power calculations, um, including unsupported synchronization options, new low power features that are defined in LP5 that reduce data transfer, single ended clocking, and dynamic frequency and voltage scaling. The other features are features that could be applied to multitude of technologies, including um, LP5 as well as other technologies. So I've listed some here looking at per command burst length, optimizing our refresh story, um, adding uh, row hammer mitigation with refresh management, ensuring that we have an accurate story for on die termination. For an LP5 perspective, this will affect the bus turnaround and also the power. Multi-rank considerations looking at synchronization and non-target termination, and then multi-cycle command support beyond what we've defined for LP5. So thank you very much for listening to this video. I look forward to the discussion in the Gem5 workshop. To summarize, we have added new features for the DDR controller within GEM5. These features were specifically added to enable LPDDR5. We've subsequently also added LPDDR5 configurations to test these out. Um, and again, I look forward to more discussion in the GEM5 workshop. Thank you.